Again, um, welcome to part two of um, the stories that I'm going to be telling you of my own experiences in the Rhodesian Army as a national serviceman, uh, then a territorial officer, and finally um, as an instructor in part two. Um, I left off last time where we had walked down this very long dark path um, at night down into the Zambezi Valley um, to start our patrol in that area the next morning. This was just west of Vic Falls, probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 kilometers west of Vic Falls. Um, the, the thing that struck me as I walked down that pathway that night at the head of this column of my platoon, which was about uh, 20 odd men, I guess, 25, no, maybe even 30 men, <laughs> I forget, um, was this, um, the sound of the footfalls behind me. Uh, the smell of the bush, it had that slightly uh, dusty, uh, urine-y sort of uh, smell that you get in the bush. Um, the trees around left and right of us were fairly sparse and stubby, sort of this, um, I don't know what you would call it, Mapani type of shrub. I don't know if they grew up there, but they weren't very big trees like you would get in the softer climates of the world. But one thing that struck me was the beauty of the stars. Um, there's no place in the world like Africa to see this absolute carpet of stars stretched above me. And it was a, a magnificent view walking down towards the Zambezi River, which divides Rhodesia from Zimbabwe, uh, from Zambia. <laughs> Jumping ahead of myself there. And um, the river ran through there, the Zambezi River. It averaged in width, width from 200 yards, meters to, in some places, five, six, seven hundred yard meters wide. Um, so it sort of went narrow and pulsed out a bit. And there were lots of little islands dotted along the whole length of it from Kazangul in the west to Victoria Falls, which was our operational area. And this river looked like a silver snake running through the trees. And way over to the right, I could just see the lights of Livingston which sort of looked like um, uh, the red jewels of this snake or serpent's eyes. So I had the Silver River and the lights of Livingston looked like its eyes, which was quite profound and it stuck with me for the 40 odd years since I experienced that. As we got right down to the T-junction at the bottom of this um, uh, pathway, we, we hit the dirt road that ran parallel with the river um, as I approached that, um, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, and I got quite a, a fright, um, a scrick, as we called it, that this big thing was towering in front of me, gently swaying. I didn't know what it was. Was it an elephant? Couldn't smell an elephant. You can smell them. Uh, what the heck was it? So, with my heart pounding away, I inched forward. Uh, ready to fire, only to discover that it was a, a wall of elephant grass, which um, in some parts of the country can grow 12 feet high, 14 feet high. Uh, I know once I jumped out of a helicopter into elephant grass and I just seemed to fall forever because the grass is so darn high. But anyway, much relieved that it wasn't an elephant or some other alien things staring back at me, um, I relaxed a bit more and then uh, I cut right uh, or east into the bush, a uh, fairly steep slope at that point, and I walked along and then back up again to find a place where we could sleep for the night overlooking our tracks um, at the entry point. Th this was a tactic we used in the Rhodesian Army that when we slept for the night we usually did a dog leg and backed up onto the tracks we had left coming in to our sleeping position so that we could observe anybody who was following us and ambush them. I found a suitable place to sleep uh, where our profile wasn't silhouetted against the skyline 
and uh, said to God, and I lay on my back looking up at those stars, and uh, it, it, the sounds of the bush were just magnificent. I'll never forget them as long as I live. And the next morning, we found some water nearby. Uh, we were still about 150 meters from the river, um, but I didn't want to um, expose myself, myself or our guys to the uh, prying eyes on the other side of the river in Zambia. Um, and so <clears throat> we found water in a, a rock pool nearby, and it's the first time in my life I've drunk animal piss, particularly probably elephant pee. We filtered it through our socks and stuck it into the, the tin mugs that we had and made some tea. Um, in case I forget to tell you this in, in future episodes, so, uh, the, in, in our ration packs we got all sorts of goodies. We had jam, we had biscuits that we could make into uh, all sorts of delightful things. Um, but we also used to get packets of, of milk powder. And I think at some point in time, we got uh, packets of potato mash as well. Now, these packets weren't labeled. And I remember, I think it was in inside Mozambique, I was really dying for a cup of tea, got the thing water boiling away, uh, put the sugar in, tea bag, all ready to go. I can't stand drinking tea without milk. So I grabbed my unlabeled packet of what I thought was milk only to put um, potato mash powder into my tea. So I basically ate my tea on that occasion. Um, why they couldn't just label them as milk and potato mash, I don't know. But the day dawned brilliant, beautiful, sunny blue day. Um, uh, we were there in about um, May 1976, I guess. So it had been a fairly chilly evening. Uh, but the day is just beautiful um, there in Africa. Blue skies, that's what we get in winter in, in uh, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. Uh, in fact, I believe it was voted the best weather in the world on more than one occasion. Beautiful, ice sparklingly blue skies. And I set some guys off to have their breakfast while others stood guard. I called the stick leaders together and we figured out our areas of patrol along the riverfront. Um, I used natural um, things like river inlets and going into the main river as boundaries. Uh, made sure they understood their call sign numbers and the radio frequency, tested their radios, had all their breakfast, and then we split up into, into groups to walk to our respective patrol areas. And, and the task in hand was to see if any um, <clears throat> terrorist had rowed across the river from Zambia uh, to enter the country. So we were basically doing a foot patrol along the riverfront, not right up against the water, um, but slightly inland, so that we could remain hidden from the Zambian shoreline. But occasionally, I'm sure we broke through cover and we could be seen which did lead to a little bit of a punch-up at one point. Um, <clears throat> but the sand, uh, the soil was very, very sandy, and it was very easy to pick up spore. We'd all had rudimentary uh, tracking training, um, but I certainly couldn't have passed any Salu Scout course, course or anything like that. But, you know, to be able to pick up tracks, uh, human tracks, was very easy in that area. Um, and obviously, the... the the animals don't wear combat boots or shoes. So if you saw a shoe in that area, all tourists, I think, had stopped by that point. They'd probably, probably been banned from going in there because of landmines, the threat of landmines. And so if you saw um, a human footprint, uh, one that had been clad in shoes or even barefoot, you knew straight away that you were onto somebody that shouldn't have been there. So having set the guys up in their, their patrol areas, we went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Um, and this happened for a long, 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 long part of uh, my national service in that area. Just patrolling up and down the river, uh, we would uh, move a little bit inland to have our last meal. 
just towards uh, sunset around about there and then we would walk um, in a, a sort of a circle about 200 yards meters away from where we ate and gradually as it was dark enough to get up to the, the river position we would move forward so that we were actually lying on the banks of the river. Um, later on I was given a, a very fancy uh, night sight which was attached to my, my FN rifle and uh, it was powered by batteries and um, uh, it, it lit up the, the night environment like you can't believe. Um, in fact it was so sensitive that if you aimed it at a star or a part of the moon this thing would screech at you, hey that's too much light. So I had I had this weapon, I'd zeroed it and it had a little dot in the middle and I could look at the river and um, my rifle was basically passed down the group of guys as we ambushed. We'd broken up into sticks of four, the reason being that in the Rhodesian army our helicopters could only carry four fully kitted up uh, troopers. Um, I have heard or read that Special Forces guys pushed that to the limit. You may have got five in there or six, I don't know, but I have read it, I remember that. So if we ever had to be uplifted by a helicopter, the four of us would get on board. It would be no good being a, a five-man stick or a six-man stick and then you can't get uplifted. So the four of us uh, look at the river, we divide up the, the number of hours from the time we started our, our sleeping routine until we woke up before first light. Um, we divided those hours amongst the four guys and the, the rifle and a watch was passed from one guy to the other. Um, when my rifle left me, of course, um, I had the rifle of the guy next to me, it was passed to the left and so on, just so that that night sight could pass down the road. Um, we did months of that. Uh, we never saw anything. I got there when it was pretty quiet, to be honest. We had some interesting evenings whereby there was a farm on the other side in Zambia and a lot of clunking and dragging of metal um, trunks seemed to go on one night and we reported this. And um, not many weeks later, um, some of our guys thought they had seen um, terrorists move on an island uh, just west of Victoria Falls, quite a large island. If you go onto a map and have you look at it, called Chundu Island. Uh, there were guys from, from a, one of my call signs, so um, when we were pulled back at the end of that patrol, it was decided by the company commander that we'd get a national parks boat and we'd go across to the island and and see what was going on there. Well, the the plan developed and uh, I think we had about 20 or 30 guys, possibly 40. We had two platoons, uh, Pete Wells' platoon and my platoon. Uh, some would offer covering fire from the shore because the, the banks of this Chindu island were only Oh, I don't know, 200 yards away, meters, very, very close. So, anyway, we um, the night came along, and uh, I was really angry because Pete Wells had been given the wonderful task of getting in the boats and crossing over to the island, rather a little bit like a D-Day, a D-Day landing. And I was put out by this, so I said to the Major, it was my guys that had spotted the, um, the, the, the movement on the island, and I would uh, insist that it was my guys that did the, the D-Day landing. So we got into a bit of a, a, a fuzz getting to the, the start point opposite the island with the boats, because we couldn't find the National Parks officers in the dead of night to get the boat, but we eventually did. We got the boat put on the back of a Land Rover, uh, drove it down the road to uh, a, a launch point, um, and then I think about eight or ten of us climbed into the into the boat. Um, the the river swept by at a heck of a rate, um, and it was only first light. And of course, it was 
quite nerve-wracking being in that boat because um, not only was the water sweeping by at a heck of a rate, and if we'd fallen out, we would have been swept away or, or drowned even. And we were right down only about four to six inches from the gunwales of the of the boat. But anyway, we gunned over to this little island and we jumped ashore like our forefathers did in, in on the beaches of Normandy. In fact, my dad was a pilot, and um, not not a pilot, but was in the air force in the Second World War and overflew the Normandy beach. And he said it was an amazing sight. So I sort of had this picture in my mind that we were a mini D-Day invasion. The boat went back for a second and third wave, and I waited for those to arrive. And then uh, we slowly but surely crested this um, little sand dune in front of us. And I just poked my head over the top behind a little bush and swept along with my binoculars. Couldn't really see much, but there were some odd-looking structures on the eastern end of the island. So we came up over the crest. I put a machine gun on the left to cover us in case we got hit at that point. And we rose up over the crest, and then we turned at right angles, and uh, we moved forward very cautiously in an extended line, and went right to the edge of the island. We did find uh, spore and tracks there, and... Um, the, the were actually strike marks from the guys who'd seen them on the island. Uh, they'd opened fire on them, and we could see where some of the bullets had hit the palm trees. And all these tracks uh, ran into the water on the Zambian side of the island, and they disappeared. So there very, was very much um, a possibility that um, some nonsense was going on there, or, or planning to use that island, which actually belonged to Zambia, I believe. Uh, to use as a launch into our territory. The Sunday Mail, <laughs> they made it sound like we'd thought of a massive D-Day invasion, but of course we, we'd scared some people off the place. But I suppose we were, we were deterrents um, rather than um, having a, a great victory there. So anyway, that, that little scene ended, and... Um, we just carried on patrolling and patrolling and patrolling and uh, interspersed with our times back at R&R &R in the village or a couple of days off in between patrols. Um, anybody from Sergeant and above, um, I was a, a second loot, we were allowed to go into the casinos, uh, which was a wonderful thrill. The Elephant Hills Hotel was magnificent with plush furniture, lovely swimming pools, and to heck with the furniture and all that, that, that was full of beautiful girls that were creepiest. And so we, I and um, the other sergeants and Pete, we used to go in there and try and win some money. Um, I got paid, I think it was $120 a month as a national serviceman. And I remember the, the first day that I was in the Elephant Hills Hotel one evening, um, I lost $85 in about 12 minutes. So I, don't, I didn't recommend that to any of my buddies. These ladies were darn efficient in getting rid of my money. I felt really stupid. But anyway, it was nice to relax, um, to be out of our smelly clothes. And we used to scrape this fat layer of ticks off our legs. And um, we would just relax. The swimming pools were open to us. And um, we had some great times on our r and rs And I happened to meet a girl at the casino hotel by the name of Marilyn. Uh, she's still in Zimbabwe, so I won't give her surname. But it was soon very apparent that we were attracted to each other. And after many months, we actually became boyfriend and girlfriend. And she lived at Vic Falls. And um, she was a creepy and on my nights off when we were in camp. I used to go and stay with her and very quickly fell in love with her. Um, it was kind of an experience in a out of Africa feeling or gone with the wind feeling, having this girl and the war was around us and Vic Falls, the village, was miles from anywhere and so we had this feeling of being isolated away from the rest of the country, right on the border of, of an aggressive enemy and so there was a lot of uh, togetherness and camaraderie and 
uh, we used to go to parties that the croupiers from the other casino and our casino, we used to go to the house parties and it was a delightful time. I was young and full of vigor and um, I met some, well I saw some beautiful girls there. I had Marilyn clutched on my arm. She wouldn't let me go and it, it was, um, I can imagine what people experienced in the Second World War in London and other cities where you just went out and had fun because you didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring. And as time went by, Vic Falls got really hammered by the enemy through mortar attacks and so on. So it was a time where we bonded together and um, uh, a fascinating time. Now part of, part of our so-called tour of duty there uh, was to go out to a keep um, uh, about 40, 40 or 45 kilometers east of Big Falls on a dirt road that ran sort of parallel with the, the Zambezi River. And the idea of these keeps were to monitor and look after and, and protect and uh, uh, the local populations from the terrorists. And obviously to send patrols out from there and to gather information. Uh, well, this keep was called Jambezi. It was sand berms that had been pushed up by a bulldozer, uh, rather like the dividing wall in the Kuwait war. It was just a, a wall of sand. Uh, we had a bunker at each corner, which could accommodate about six men in each corner, uh, a water tower, um, uh, two A-frame asbestos topped uh, like dormitories and then uh, my my section uh, well myself and, and my sergeants and corporals were, were put in a smaller A-frame with a kitchen at the back. Um, it was an interesting time. I had many many interesting experiences there. Um, the one night uh, we'd been harassing uh, or trying to just frustrate the locals a little bit to see whether we could get any information out of them or any movement from the terrorists to try and engage with us because we just couldn't find any in that area. Even though the Salu Scouts came in, killed a few at one point and made us look stupid. Um, but you know, we were national servicemen and we did our best with, within our training and the scope um, of expectations. and. Um, so the one night I felt, you know, the guys had been patrolling hard and uh, I, I decided very foolishly, but I was a young, impulsive man, to get into a 4-5 with a couple of guys on the back and I drove off to uh, a fishing lodge east of us on the, over the Matetsi River. Um, I forget the name of that fishing place. But anyway, I went there to buy some beers for the guys so that when they came back from their patrols, we would have a couple of beers and um, um, some cattle had stood on a landmine and been blown up. And so there was meat freshly packaged for us hanging up in the trees. We just went and pulled it down, cut off a bit of skin, uh, shot a couple of cattle that hadn't quite died from the mine blast. And we had a, a chef on call up with us, and so we were expecting a lovely meal. And after, uh, I nipped out to um, go and pick up the bears from this fishing place. And on the way back, it was getting dark now, I noticed that there was green and red tracer flying all over the place uh, above the keep parapet walls, and um, uh, flares going off. and sounds of explosions and all sorts of stuff and I, I just went absolutely cold. I couldn't get through to anybody on the radio and uh, by the time I got there the shooting had stopped which had been going on for over an hour. It was discovered the next morning that uh, 52 terrorists had attacked the camp um, that sort of parked off from on the left hand side the northwest side in a long extended line and they'd really pummeled the place. Um, over to the left or west they'd used a, a store which they'd paced out during the day so they could get the distance. They put some mortars there 
Um, I don't know if they were 82s, they might have been a smaller type that they had, but they dropped um, 52 rounds with incredible accuracy in, into the compound. Now, when my vehicle, bouncing along the road all on its own, got back to the gate to get in, nobody would come down to the gate and open it. But I didn't really appreciate at that point exactly what they'd been through. So I blew my hooter and I said, open the bloody gate. And somebody came running down. Um, I forget his name now, skinny little guy. And he said, you can't believe what we've, what's happened to us, sir. We've been really raped. And anyway, he opened the gate and, and ran like a back at bat out of the hill, back up the sand berm into, into the bunker. And then I went inside. I could smell cordite everywhere. I went back inside and I radioed Vic Falls. I gave a report of what had happened. And they said in the morning they will send out um, some iron sides, which were armored cars, and some helicopters to try and do a follow-up. Anyway, the next morning dawned. And um, uh, so we then started to realize that there had been quite a big punch-up. Uh, we counted um, thousands of doppies from the fire point. Um, we, we counted 52, well, we found 52 tail fins. Um, the, the majority of them landed just, just on the outskirts or the lip of the berms, uh, four or five inside. One had landed right at the the blast wall of the bunker I would have run into. Uh, you know, if, when when the shit hit the fan, we all had our bunkers allocated by me with boxes of ammo in there in case we had to stay in there a long time. Each bunker had its own radio. And the bunker I would have run into had this uh, crater and tail fin right by the, the blast wall. And I often wonder... Um, because I'm a Christian, and I often wonder whether God got me out of the camp that night. I'd, I'd been in camp for weeks and been on patrol for weeks, but the night that we got attacked, I went to go and get beers. And anyway, um, I often wonder if that, that mortar would have killed me. So it was quite a profound, profound feeling. And then we discovered a few injured African civilians outside the keep. Uh, one kid had a hole through his hip and coming out his bum. So we patched him up in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the method we'd been trained. Um, helicopters arrived. They took him off to a hospital, plus one other couple of other civilians. We also had some guard force guys with us with their 303 rifles. They hadn't been allocated bunkers, and these guys lay on the parapet walls with their 303s, returning steady fire into the, into the enemy positions. And I really admire them for that, because there's nothing more creepy than wondering where a landmine's going to land on your back, not a landmine, a mortar. And these guys stood their ground. A couple of them had superficial shrapnel wings, and they were loaded up and put on the helicopter. Um, a couple of ferrets and a couple of elands arrived with um, uh, an escorting 25, that's a Unimog, German Unimog, two and a half tonner, that with infantry in it. Now our infantry vehicles were good. Our troops faced outwards towards the enemy. I've seen so many movies where troops face each other. Now what's the point of that? If you get ambushed when you're driving on the road, you're going to shoot the guy in front of you. So anyway, these guys all arrived, and we, we commenced follow-ups where we could. Um, but the terrorists, like in many parts of the country, um, had this unique system of driving cattle across their spore, and the 52 gooks split up, and then they split up, and they split up. Uh, the cattle were driven across them, and, and we lost them. Although the scouts did find um, some... Uh, a few of them further north, uh, where massive amounts of equipment were later recovered. I think 12.7s and everything were built up on these rocks. Um, they killed a few of them. You know, war's ugly. I just remember coming into camp and there was a big hoo-ha because there were a couple of dead bodies lying there and, and the one... the one guard had half his head removed and all his brains were spilled out. 
and we had chickens in the camp, and the chickens were picking away at his brain. It's just these ugly sights of war that you don't forget. And, you know, we used to eat some of the chickens, but I went off chicken from that point. Um, <laughs> and we used, the one time the guy said to me, how good a shot are you, you sir? And I said, oh, I'm okay. I've got my marksmanship badge. So they said, I bet you can't shoot this chicken if we throw it off the water tower. So I said, oh, come on, it's a shotgun. You, you could hit a barn door, you know. So anyway, this guy climbed, Abbott, his name was, climbed all the way to the top of this tower and threw this petrified chicken off. And as it flew away, I, I blasted it with both barrels and I missed. I couldn't believe it. What a, what a humiliating. Then they took the chicken up again and I said, I'm going to kill you, damn thing. Because I think it was the one that had been picking brains and, and I shot and I missed the darn thing. Four four uh, cartridges wasted on that stupid chicken. Anyway, one of the inc other incidents that happened out at Jambezi was um, uh, we were having breakfast one morning and um, uh, we heard this massive bang and we deployed out to see what was going on and a Coca-Cola truck had hit a left front uh, a detonation of a landmine. Uh, a boosted mine. Uh, the driver was hanging up in shreds in a tree like the cattle was. Uh, and um, But anyway, I think about a third of the bottles of Coke and Fanta and everything else survived. So we had our packets, our bags full of uh, Fanta and Coke bottles for, for days after that. Um, it was a hot place. Uh, physically hot and comfortable to operate in that area. We had a lot of rain. Uh, we could hear from the dogs barking at night who was moving in the area. Um, so we used to drop a couple of rook mortar rounds over towards wherever we heard, heard dogs barking. But um, it, it, was an, it was an interesting time out there. And um, I remember the police coming along to interview their informants. They, uh, I went on one with a guy called Ian, big tall blonde guy, and uh, his sidekick was called Nipple because he was a short little guy. And when I shook Nipple's hand for the first time, I said, you're the first time I've ever shaken the front part of a tit. And he said, oh, I've heard that joke before. But anyway, we went out to meet the informant and um, uh, we had a bag of money with us, and this guy, he, who looked like his clothes had been worn for a hundred years, with matted hair, he sort of slunk out the bush and got information from him, and um, uh, we paid him, and then, then we disappeared. And that happened all the time with the police uh, guys with us. Um, yeah, the, uh, another thing I forgot to tell you, after that, that hour long mortar attack of the camp, all the meat that we'd collected from those dead cattle were in the kitchen. And the chef had been preparing them, salting them, and doing all sorts of stuff. And he had a mushroom sauce going along. Well, unfortunately, one of the five or six rounds that landed in the camp went right through the kitchen ceiling and blew the hell out of the stove and the kitchen and everything that was in there, including our meat which was all covered in shards of glass. So we were back to eating bully beef that night. But it was an interesting time. Um, one other time we were instructed to actually take out curfew breakers because it was getting, um, they, they were, you know, they were just uh, chancing their luck too much walking around after the 6 p.m. curfew. So we went out in a couple of trucks uh, northeast of the keep and we walked about five or ten k's in, in, into Posse. I'll never forget that night. It was a starlit night with the moon, and all these huts were like on, on the ridge uh, of this amphitheater, and the dogs could hear us coming in. And uh, so we slunk around to the back, and we thought we could hear somebody walking up a pathway, so we got into a quick ambush position. You know, it could have been a gook, we don't know, but we were 
uh, task to take out anything that moved after after dark. And this guy came up the pathway. We couldn't see whether he was a civilian or a or a tur. And and we we took him out. And there's about 15 of us that fired at this guy. And you cannot believe that as that sound died down and the echoing um, drifted away, that we could hear him saying, no power, no power, no power. So he was still alive. I couldn't believe it. He'd, he'd got one bullet through his stomach. And as we walked up to him, one of the guys put a torch on his face. And he was only a youngster. And all the guys were saying, let's pull him, you know. And I just couldn't do that. I just could not kill a civilian of that age who was maybe 18 or so, like a kid. His mother came screaming out of the hut, as a few adults did. And um, what to do with this guy now? The nearest hospital was, was 100 kilometers away. And whether I was right or wrong or stupid, I don't know. But I sent one of the vehicles all the way to Wanky with a... Uh, a very good armed escort back there. Um, and I believe that guy survived, and he's still running around with a little bit of uh, copper jacket in him, no doubt. But war's an ugly thing, and I don't, I don't rejoice in death. It's a horrible thing, especially when your own guys die. And, you know, listening to the Fighting Men of Rhodesia series, the guys talking about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And as little as I did, I, I didn't do a lot. I've already said this in episode one. I still found that um, when airplanes flew over at night, so I remember the one time in a flat in Glen Lawn, I pulled this airplane flew over us because we lived close to the airport. And I pulled a dragon and screaming out of the bed. And um, she's sitting over there smiling at me as I say this. And, and she said, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I, I said, I, 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 oh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't remember. I, I, I can't, I'll tell you in the morning. And I climbed back into bed. But in my mind, we were being attacked by this, through the, the Air Force jet, even though the enemy never had Air Force jets. Well, they did. I'll tell you about that now. Um, and, you know, my nerves were, were bad. They were just bad. I'm going to close on the last story of that part of my national service at Vic Falls. We'd got so agitated about not meeting the enemy and we were just being eaten alive by ticks. We were more like tourists looking at the game, which was magnificent there. I saw lions mating, very rare, beautiful kudu. You know, we we would lie up against an anthill during the day and have our tea and and look at the, the, the baboons and the monkeys and the trees and, and the long vines that, that fell down from the treetops. It was just idyllic country. Sables, beautiful sables with their curved horns. And um, anyway, I was close to the river and we saw a Zambian army patrol come down to the riverbank. And they were technically our enemy. They had officially declared war on us at one point. But we were told not to engage them unless we actually had to, uh, like if they'd opened up on us. And so I thought, stuff this. And um, very foolishly, being a young national serviceman, 20 odd years of age, um, I put a round over the river into a tree next to them because they were fetching water. And I just wanted to scare them basically, which, which happened. They looked very surprised and then ducked back into the bush. Uh, the consequences of which were absolutely <laughs> horrific, because not only did, did we get hammered on our side with rockets and all sorts of things coming back, but um, I saw a glint up in the sky, and there was a Zambian Air Force aircraft, I'll never forget it, a silver-bodied plane. It looked just like the Impala type of design, which is an Air Mackey that the South African Air Force had, and its uh, wings glinted in the setting sun, and it had red rockets under its wings, and uh, this thing banked and sort of headed towards us, 
and as it reached the bank on its side, it pulled up and went west. And uh, under a hail of fire, I just told the guys to withdraw, and we ran east down the road and got picked up. It was at that point that I felt really dizzy. I couldn't think clearly. The glands in my legs were swollen. And the next thing I knew, I was in hospital with tick bite fever. And that's where I'll leave it for now. Um, I'll relate more about Victoria Falls, because uh, I have a few interesting stories to tell you about that place. But that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. So thank you for listening to my second story. And um, if you could recommend it to your friends and hit a like button, that would be great. Thank you very much.